Hey friends, Andy Jenkins back, giving you another bonus episode. Really, we're in a mini-series within the larger podcast talking about this area of emotional health, of soul freedom. Uh, Really, we're doing that because I'm releasing the first round of the five-week Freedom March group coaching intensive. And unashamedly, I'm sharing some information with you because I want you to explore this and see if that group coaching intensive is for you. I've put a link down in the show notes where you can follow it, where you can take a deeper dive and grab more information and see really how it works. Uh, But what I'm doing on these bonus episodes is really just dripping out some of the video content that I've recorded back in the spring and letting you really just kind of explore this idea and, and say, hey, is this something that would help me? And if it is, join the call, join the group. If it doesn't, then perhaps you know someone that this information would benefit and you can pass it on or maybe you need it at some point in the future. Today, we're going to talk about the first of three types of soul wounds. The first of three, I think, big heavy hitters that can trip and trap and trick any of us. Now, let me tell you what the three are, just so you know what's coming. The first one is uh, triggers, that's past trauma from PTSD, post-traumatic stress. And again, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. That's really when it's diagnosed. But but I want to really use that term a little bit loosely, not in the sense to diagnose, treat, or prescribe, but to, to really refer back to that idea that we talked about previously, that a lot of people live with this undiagnosable struggle and you can be affected by something in the emotional world all the same, even if you are not at the area of receiving a diagnosis. And so PTSD, uh, triggers, trauma, that's group number one. We'll talk about that today. Uh, Group number two, we'll discuss that in the next episode, in the next release. That's where we're going to be talking about guilt and shame, about overcoming Moral injury is the more formal title of that. I learned that when I was doing some work, writing a book on staff with Crosswinds Foundation for Faith and Culture. Uh, We released a curriculum for veterans, and Crosswinds has done incredible work in that area. has a couple documentaries, even a third one on on families dealing with uh, veteran-related trauma that is going to be released at some point in the next 12 months. Uh, Incredible resources. This one encompasses uh, guilt, shame, moral injury, survivor's guilt. That's another cluster of soul wound. The third is soul ties. And we'll come back to that in two more episodes. Now, soul ties are when our hearts are attached to either the wrong things, so they're attached to something that would be an addiction, something that we typically think of those as as sin issues. So they're attached to drugs. Well, that's that's a soul issue. But but there are also unhealthy heart attachments to things that could be good things. We can attach to people in unhealthy ways. We can attach to work in an unhealthy way and become a workaholic. We can attach our hearts to the wrong things or attach our hearts to the right things in the wrong ways. And the result is equally devastating. And so we're going to tackle that one uh, two episodes from now. Now today, I'm going to give you two episodes or two video audio tracks here. Uh, These are coming, again, from the video course that I previously shot. And this one is from video six and video seven. It's kind of a one-two punch about post-traumatic stress or dealing with the past. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to roll into video number one, and I'm going to talk about triggers, and then I'm going to roll you right into, you'll you'll hear the music cue, and then you'll hear the music intro cue right back, right into video number two that really talks about how if we don't get this right, it just creates this flywheel of momentum, and a flywheel can move you in a bad direction, in an unhealthy direction, and it can really be a foe that hinders you, or flywheel can be a friend that moves you in a healthy direction and actually helps you. And so we want to get in the healthy, helpful side. 
And then after I play both of those, I'll be back and give you a little bit more information about the five-week Freedom March Soul Wholeness Intensive. And again, if that's something that resonates with you, I'd love for you to join that and join me. We start in March, uh, marching on November the 22nd. It's coming up quick, and I know the holidays are coming, and that's exactly why we're doing the first round right then. Okay, listen in. I'll be back at the end. There are three types of soul wounds that we want to talk about. The first one is what it means to get triggered. That's going to lead us into a conversation about post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's the first of three points. The first one is this, your perception is not always reality, nor is mine. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that I draw a six um, that is six feet tall and I do this on the sidewalk in front of my house and I just very clearly tell everybody, hey, I've just drawn a six because at the time when I wrote this material originally, <laughs> my son, who's now seven, he was actually six and he had just celebrated his sixth birthday birthday and so I drew a big six to celebrate happy birthday Salter you're six well let's say that you walk up to me and you're there for the birthday party and you look and from your vantage point you say well if your little boy is only six why did you draw a nine and I tell you I didn't I drew a six and you say no 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 like I'm, I'm, I'm standing right here and this is clearly a nine and I say, no, I, you're, you're actually incorrect. Salter is six. That six is six feet tall. There's all kinds of objective data that say that this is a six. It's a six. And besides, I created it. I knew what I was creating. And you say, no, you created, you drew a nine. My question to you watching the video is, in this example, which I know it's foolish, who's right? Am I right that it's a six? Or are you correct that it's a nine? Now, I've taught this example and used this in multiple venues, and invariably, someone always says, always, you're both right. The reality is, we can't both be right. Not in this example. I saw a cartoon like this floating around on the internet, and somebody was using it to kind of show a political reality. See, what you see depends on where you're standing. Well, the truth is, reality actually is objective. We don't like to think about it like that, but it is. That six is six feet tall. Salter is six, and I made it as a six. And when we start walking through life, the same thing is true. So often in that simple example, we see bigger versions of it happen regularly, particularly when past trauma is involved. Sometime in the last year, I was teaching a group of veterans over at my house. We were talking about post-traumatic stress, and one of the gentlemen that was there, he said something like this. He said, yeah, I don't like the 4th of July. And I asked him, I was like, well, why? You obviously were willing to give your life for the country. I mean, this guy had deployed to Afghanistan multiple times and fought. And he said, well, I love our country, and I love what the 4th of July symbolizes. But so often on the 4th of July, there are fireworks and people keep shooting them and it gets to be excessive and it makes me feel like I'm under mortar fire like I was back in the Middle East. And he says, I have to remind myself that fireworks aren't mortar fire, that I'm home, that I'm safe. Usually I, you just pull the curtains, I turn off the lights, I watch a movie that's loud, that kind of knocks off some of that sound, and I just do my best to get away. See, in that time, his perception, fireworks, is not reality, mortar fire. That's different. Uh, I interviewed on a podcast uh, one woman whose husband was traumatized by his experience in war. And so often when they would be out to eat, he would hear sounds of cars backfiring and loud engines. And to him, it would sound a lot like the gunfire that he heard when he was deployed. You see, perception is not reality. That perception, a backfiring engine, a loud car, is not gunfire. I remember having another friend over uh, to my house who was involved with special forces and he sat down at my kitchen table and he opened a bottle of essential oil frankincense and as he smelled it instantly he pushed back from the table gently his eyes watered he gently cried 
It, it was so almost awkward, but yet quiet and tender that I, I asked him, I said, are, are, are you okay? And he said, yeah, hold on just a second. He breathed deep, and then after a few moments, he looked up and he said, all right, I'm okay. When I was in the Middle East, I went into a lot of camel driver's tents, and it smelled exactly like that during that time. And you see, in each of these instances, perception was not reality. A backfiring engine is not gunfire. Fireworks is not mortar fire. Sitting at my table and smelling frankincense is not a camel driver's tent. Now, some of these misperceptions, not all, some of them might be related to post-traumatic stress. The American Psychiatric Association defines post-traumatic stress as this. It's a psychiatric disorder that can occur. Notice it can, it might or it might not occur in people who have experienced or witnessed. So it can be something that you endured or it can be something that you just saw or even heard about. It, it can occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event such as, now, now notice this list, a natural disaster, a serious accident, a terrorist act, war or combat, rape, or other violent personal assault. I want you to notice several things about that definition. Notice it, it might occur, it might not. It can occur because you experienced it or because you witnessed it, or, and it still may occur, it still may not. And notice the list of things that can cause it. And this is not a complete list. This is just a such as these events could cause it. There are other things that aren't on that list that might cause post-traumatic stress. I often tell some of the veterans that I meet with, I, I remind them that war is not the exclusive angle on post-traumatic stress. And I tell that to them and say, I, I don't mean to minimize your experience with war and anything that you're carrying from that. I say that because you lived a lot of life before that deployment and then you have lived a lot of life since that deployment. And so don't focus only on the deployment, focus on all of life. And don't go try to dig up and find something. If there's something you need to deal with, it will come to mind and you will know precisely that you need to deal with that soul hurt, that soul wound. But it's worth looking at the scope of all things that you're dealing with. While you're opening up the trunk and taking all the baggage out, while you're opening up the closet and letting all the skeletons out, it makes sense just to deal with all of it. And then I remind them of this, like you are the pain skill. Like you, you, only you can talk about how it's affected you because the reality is people can endure the same traumatic event and walk away with a different experience. We're emotionally tough and emotionally tender in different ways. Several years ago, I was eating dinner and at the table, it was me, it was a veteran from the Iraq war, it was a state trooper and it was a first responder. And I just kind of tossed out this idea, yeah, it seems like we all respond to emotional hurts very differently and sometimes it surprises us what we respond to and what hurts us and it surprises us what doesn't hurt us. And the veteran from the Iraq war, he began talking first and he says, yes, I was shot at, I was under mortar fire while I was deployed. I did not have any post-traumatic stress symptoms from that. However, I did have a lot of post-traumatic stress from when I was abused as a kid. He said, there were men that were deployed with me, I was shoulder to shoulder with them side by side, and they did have post-traumatic stress. So yes, we all respond to it in radically different ways. The state trooper then said something that was interesting. He said that before they send them out solo in a car, they want them to work with another trooper. And one of the things that they must do is they must work a traffic fatality. He said, now when you're a state trooper, most of the traffic accidents ha happen at high speed. And so they tend to be a little bit more gory than other car accidents. He said sometimes to clear the scene and to just work through all of the paperwork and then figure out what happened and how it happened could take hours. And then after you do that, you always have to go deliver the death notice to the family. He said to him, going to tell someone whom he did not know that someone else whom he did not know had died in a horrible manner was the most emotionally exhausting and draining traumatic part of all of his job. 
more traumatic than gunfire, more exhausting than just managing and figuring out and walking up on any of the crime scenes. And he actually said, I, I, I know like that sounds strange, but that's just how it is. I told him, no, it, it, it's just how it affected you. It, you are the scale. We all respond differently. The first responder that was there told about of a time when he was off work and the person who had trained him went to deliver a warrant and was killed, was killed in the line of duty. And he said, I carried survivor's guilt a long time after that. I mean, I should have been there, I felt, to stop it or to help him, or it should have been me. I wasn't even on duty. It wasn't like he went in my place instead, but I still carried something from that. You see, you and I, we respond to all kinds of things in so many different ways. And what we tend to do is we tend to undervalue the emotional hurts in ourselves because there are often bigger issues that we carry that we feel like should have affected us more and someone else always has it worse than we have it. We can't do that. We have to walk forward and deal with what's there. Here's the second point. Four signs and two responses show us when the expressions of our feelings which again, feelings aren't good or bad. The feelings are neutral. It's the expressions is where the unhealth comes. Four signs and two responses show us when our expressions get unhealthy. Now, post-traumatic stress, it is a flight or fight response. So that is the result. That are the two expressions. Um, the signs the, uh, that we would look for in post-traumatic stress are number one, you always feel like you're on. There's this hyper vigilance, this hyper alertness that you're always looking for something to go wrong, to fall apart. You're always looking over your shoulder. Uh, number two, re experiencing symptoms. So the same sounds, the same smells, the same sights may bring up old stuff. Uh, the fireworks may make you feel like you're under mortar fire. The backfiring engine may make you feel like you're under gunfire. The smell may make you feel like you're in a camel driver's tent. The uh, conversation and how it goes, uh, the person may cause you to re-experience the same symptoms. Number three is the avoidance symptoms. So you try to stay away from the things that we just listed above. You don't want to encounter them. You don't want to go back there. So you move away. Number four is you have negative feelings. You can't talk about it. You don't want to think about it. So you just put it out of mind. The result then so you've got the four signs. The two responses are fight or flight. Uh, some people fight. They turn and face the direct threat. Some people take flight. They run away from it. Now, often people will say, I've heard it's fight, flight, or freeze. Really, freeze is a version of flight. You just kind of stand still. And I would remind you, it's not exclusively an issue related to deployment or war. It's related to all kinds of trauma as the definition from the American Psychiatric Association says. Here's point number three. You're not flawed. Many times when you feel these reactions, you feel the hypervigilance, you feel the re-experiencing the symptoms or the negative feelings. When you feel all of the things related to post-traumatic stress, the avoidance symptoms, so often you feel like you're flawed. You're not flawed. Your response is totally in line with your past experience. Now, the issues arise when you react to a safe present as if it is an unsafe past. One of the gentlemen that I worked with, he had a coworker one time and they were just kind of passing each other in the hall after a meeting. And he reached over uh, and just grabbed him by the shirt, just like, hey, that was a good job. And instantly the coworker reached back and swatted at him and said, never do that again. Well, the guy I know, he went to his office and he thought, man, maybe this guy's just having a bad day. He went to his office and he just kind of sat and just kind of let him give him some space, let him cool off. And he said about 30 minutes later, that coworker came to him. Coworker opened the door and said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I, I popped off. I snapped. It's not you. It's just my stepdad used to beat me. And that was one of the things he always did was he was always grabbing my collar. Do you see? What happened was totally in line with the man's past. He wasn't flawed. The issue was he was reacting in a safe present as if it was 
an unsafe pass. This is what we saw with the mortar fire is not fireworks. The backfiring engine is not bullets. The kitchen table is not the camel driver's tent. As I was talking about this issue with veterans one night and saying, hey, you're not, you're not flawed. You're just responding to something in the present as if it's the past. One person raised their hand and they said, is that what it means to get triggered? And I said, yeah, I think it is. And then another person started talking. They said, yeah, I think you get triggered like when really something occurs and, and it's almost just like a gun firing and sending a bullet. Like internally, it's like you fire and send your emotions off in a different direction. I started taking notes. And so I, I said, what about this? And here's the definition, unofficial, not professional, total group think that we created that night. Uh, to get triggered is to find yourself hijacked by your mind or your emotions, your thoughts and feelings being uncontrollably fired in a particular direction based on soul wounds of the past. We often misread events in the present in light of the past. Triggers often create a response which would be appropriate only in a different time and place. I thought that was a pretty good definition for a bunch of non-professionals is us just really talking through the experience of how do we get whole? Because sometimes the truth is we react in the present as if it's the past. And the goal is not to get a diagnosis. The goal is to, as the psychiatrist that I met with for the evaluation said, is to realize most people aren't diagnosable. If a diagnosis is the path forward for help for you, you should absolutely go and seek a diagnosis. But for most people, it's not. For most people, just being aware and then learning how to, we talked about in the emotional wholeness checklist a couple moments ago, learning how to recognize those emotions, learning how to read what they say and what's going on, and then responding in a healthy way is totally enough. Now, in the back of this book, and you can actually access it just by following the link below this video, you can take uh, the test online. It's just a 10 question, two minutes, yes, no answers, post-traumatic self-check. When I was writing the book Warrior Hope uh, with Bob Waldrop, uh, with Crosswinds Foundation for Faith and Culture. Uh, it's the PTSD moral injury book designed for veterans to help them heal from the past and then to identify their next mission and move forward. We found on the VA website a post-traumatic stress self-check that we put in the back of that book and actually put it in this book and then cited uh, that resource uh, for you where we found it and cited the Warrior Hope book. If you go to the back, you can take the test, just 10 questions, yes, no. It takes, again, about two minutes, and it will really help you kind of assess where you are. My encouragement to you is to assess yourself regardless of where you are, remembering that where you are isn't who you are. It's just the location, and as you take hold of that, you can step forward in greater levels of health. The final thing that I would say to you in this video is just the question, what if we cared for wounded hearts in the same way we cared for wounded bodies? You see in the example at the beginning of this video, we never would have thought about leaving Judah with a broken arm or Miriam with a fractured wrist. The wounds that you have on your body, you would never think about just, ah, well, I'll just tolerate this and this is just how it's meant to be. We take care of those things. My encouragement to you is to treat soul health in the same way you would treat bodily health. Back in 2019, I was talking with a friend of mine, Dr. Benjamin Perkis. Uh, he is a guy that is, uh, by trade, he is a psychologist, and he's also involved from a home business standpoint in the world of essential oils with Young Living Essential Oils as a pretty high-ranking distributor. Uh, he created this technique called the Aroma Freedom Technique that enables people to use smells to then interact with past hurts and trauma and then to walk forward in freedom. During that season, I was writing a book, The Emotional Wholeness Checklist, and I was writing this book entitled Healthy Hustle. And so I knew because I was landing on emotions during that season, I wanted to talk with him more about his area of expertise. 
and also get him in front of the audience I had with Oily App, um, one of the businesses with which I'm involved. I wanted to get him in front of that audience for the podcast, so I recorded two podcast episodes with him, and then I also recorded a Zoom call where we put him in front of everybody to where he could share his technique with them. Here's one of the things that he told me. It leads me into the first point of this video, which is this. Three rules of human nature related to soul health govern how we each uniquely approach the world. Okay, so the first rule is this, and these are Dr. Perkis's rules. First rule is that we're designed to develop and grow as we explore. So this is why kids, when they get up, they start crawling around and they start opening up cabinets and they start tossing uh, bowls and plates and Tupperware. This is why they try to stick objects into outlets. You have to cover them or you have to watch the kid and make sure they don't go near them. This is why uh, kids consistently want to walk off into the woods or ride the bikes and go off. We're designed to explore and our growth happens as we're able to explore. In fact, you, you might have even used this term before. Um, that person is very sheltered, meaning they were kind of kept under guard. They weren't, they weren't allowed to explore. Well, that leads us to rule number two. Rule number two is that some exploration causes pain. Um, and we don't like pain. And so we start wanting to avoid that pain in the future. You know, you, you go climb a tree and you fall and you experience pain. You learn to walk and you trip, you experience pain. You uh, jump up on stage and sing and people laugh at you and don't like your singing voice that causes pain. As a result, we create rules which govern what we're going to do in the future largely by helping us avoid pain. Okay, so again, we're designed to explore and grow. Exploration causes pain. We create rules to shelter us from that pain. Um, I was talking to Dr. Perkis about this, and I told him, I said, well, you know, it, it, yeah, it makes sense because I realized that I go running a, a lot in my neighborhood, and I often dodge big dogs. And I realize I don't like big dogs unless I know the dog. If I like, if I know the dog, then I'm completely fine with the dog. But if I don't know the dog, I'm initially skittish. And it's because when I was little, I was about seven years old, I was at a friend's house and his dog just snapped at me. I walked up to pet him. He was asleep. He was in the cockpit of an airplane, which is what his bed was. Just the windshield um, was kind of his house. And I walked around it. It startled him and he snapped at me. Now, now he didn't bite me, um, but in that moment, it was a big dog, in that moment, it kind of set me on edge and made me distrustful initially of all dogs. Um, so I told Dr. Perkins, I said, there was a dog in the neighborhood where I used to live, and that little dog would run out to the driveway, and right at the driveway, he initially would cross, um, but then, you know, and I just kind of shoo him back, but, but eventually he stopped crossing the driveway and would turn at the sidewalk and then beeline all the way down the sidewalk, barking the entire time while I'm running in the street, almost like he's just shadowing me. And I said, the family finally got one of those electric fences. And he said, yeah, in the same way that you made the rule to avoid dogs, to avoid future pain and being scared, that dog had a rule because one day they put the electric fence out there, the dog went out there, had pain when he crossed the sidewalk, and so the dog makes a mental rule, never cross the sidewalk again because the sidewalk creates pain. And then he told me, he said, well, you know, that dog actually could get you now because they don't leave the little zapper there forever. Eventually the dog just learns and so they remove the zapper and the dog holds himself in place because the dog has created that rule. And I thought, oh, so the dog could get me, which then made me more alarmed about the dog. We kept on talking about it. He's like, yeah, you need a, you need a freedom session for animals only. And, it, and, and I might. I, I reminded him when my kids were little, they would always run up to me, and they would want to be chunked high in the sky. And I would throw them. I would even throw them and spin them and then catch them. And then about the age of three, even though they all loved it, they would just stop. They didn't want to be chunked anymore. They would hold and grab. And, and he told me, he said, well, by that time, they were walking and riding bikes, and they had fallen several times. 
and they had learned that even though you've never dropped them and would never drop any of them, they'd learned that falling causes pain. And that all leads us to this next issue, is these rules that we have, they create ruts, and the ruts can be good ruts, or the ruts can be bad ruts. You see, some of the rules, Dr. Perkins said, are functional, they're friends, they help us, and some of the rules are dysfunctional, they're foes, they hinder us. So you, you think functional rules might be something like, don't touch a hot stove, because if you do that, it'll burn you, don't go up too high on that ladder or don't go too close to the edge of a building. Don't jump over the rail because you would get hurt if you fell. Don't walk down a dark alley at night because that's not safe. These can be functional rules. The dysfunctional rules, the, the foes that hinder us, that can keep us from our destiny, are rules that might cause us to not trust other people in relationships. They might cause us to uh, not get close to dogs. They might cause us to not go, go live on video or to make phone calls that we need to make in order to grow our business. They might keep us from walking out our destiny. Here's what's important to remember about all of these rules, though, is the rules of the past got you to where you are. Some of those rules may have even served you well, but now it's time to look at those rules, to honestly investigate, and see if you need to create a new paradigm so you can choose your way forward. You see, so often we just say, oh, that's my story, that's how I got it, that's, you know. But your story doesn't excuse you. The story explains you, but it doesn't certainly let you off the hook from walking forward in health and wholeness. Here's point number three. We eventually get more of what we expect, creating a flywheel of momentum. A few months into writing this material, I was driving through the Huntsville area. That's where my parents live. I was coming through town from Nashville, and so I stopped just to get off and see them. We went out to eat, and I remember sitting at Red Robin with my dad, and uh, he's eating the endless bowl of salad where you pay one fee and they keep bringing you all of this lettuce over and over. I'm, I'm eating the endless fries that they have. And he asked me, it was basketball season, he said, hey, did you see uh, any of the NBA? Did you see Steph Curry playing? And Steph Curry had been just, I mean, hammering down, knocking down three-pointers. And, and I told him, it's like, I've, I've been so busy, I have not watched any basketball. Uh, this was back <laughs> pre-COVID, obviously. And he says, it, he says, it's astounding because the muscle memory that him and some of the other athletes have is such that they've practiced the shot so many times that regardless of what's going on in the moment, no matter how many defenders get in their face, no matter if he's getting knocked off balance, no matter if he's just slightly uh, ahead or slightly back of where he originally thought he was gonna be, the, the muscle memory is so on that it's almost a given that the ball is going to go into the hoop. In, in fact, that's why many times he'll shoot and he just kind of walks off. Like he knows it's going, you maybe have seen some kids mimic this, like they shoot and just walk off. And of course they don't have the muscle memory, so theirs doesn't go in. Now think about that because I think that soul memory is exactly the same. When you have an experience and the experience that you've explored causes pain, you create rules to avoid the pain, you then have the experience, it'll cause pain, you avoid pain, you learn, experience, avoid the pain, learn from the experience, avoid the pain. You and I start creating this soul memory. This is exactly what happened with the previous examples where I had the friend that uh, the fireworks or mortar fire confusion the backfiring engine, gunfire confusion, the smell of frankincense, camel driver tent confusion, some of the conversations that are, are said uh, to us and some of the remarks that are made that cause us to kind of stir up is there's this soul memory of something that actually occurs. I mean, think about basketball. What, what if Steph Curry went out there and practiced the wrong shot a thousand times or more in the wrong way? and he consistently missed the shot for a thousand times, even almost as if he intentionally did it, not that he would do that, but when, when he got out there on the court, he would probably miss the shot because the muscle memory would become unhealthy. And in the same way, I think if we do the soul memory in an unhealthy way over and over, or if it served us in the past, but it's not serving us now, the same exact same thing can happen. We end up with this, as the title of the video says, 
this belief expectation flywheel. We have an experience. We have certain beliefs about the experience, things we'll do, things we'll avoid based on the rules that we've created. Uh, we uh, have expectations as we go into the experience that affects our behavior and that behavior affects our experience. Well, that solidifies our beliefs. Uh, the beliefs become our expectations about what will happen. We behave in a certain way that affects our experience and over and over this continues occurring, making things stronger. Eventually, you have a script that you're living out. It may be a healthy one. It may be an unhealthy one. It may take place at the job. It may take place in a relationship. It may take place with your health. It may take with how you're carrying yourself in business. And in video 14, we'll actually talk about how to rewrite the script because that might be something that needs to occur. You see, here's the overview of this lesson. There are three rules of human nature related to soul health that govern how we approach the world. The rules are we grow by exploring, exploring causes pain, and we create rules to avoid that pain. The rules, they can create ruts, both good and bad. All rules aren't bad, but all rules, if you live them out long enough, they create a rut that can help you or that can hinder you. And eventually, point number three, we get more of what we expect, creating a flywheel of momentum. What you and I wanna do is create momentum that moves in the right direction. So there you have it. All of that information really gives you a great introduction to soul wound type number one of three, which is really dealing with triggers. Uh, that's just kind of the informal term right there. Uh, let me direct you to the link that's in the show notes below. That's going to take you to my website where you can learn about the Freedom March. If this is something that is for you, I want to alert you to a couple of the bonus features that come with this course. Bonus number one is this. There's really what we're calling a Freedom March methodology. That is a daily cheat sheet of things for you to do every 24-hour period. I think what I want to do is empower you to create, like we discussed in this audio here, this, the second half, is a flywheel of new momentum that moves you in the right direction. Faith and freedom, they're really meant to be lived out in the real world. They're not meant to be something that is exclusively a Sunday morning type of thing or exclusively when you're in a small group with a, with a church group or a, a group of friends. It's something that really has to work for all of life. And so we've really identified, I think, five different things to do every single day uh, that don't take too long, but they, they just really set you moving in the right direction. And so in that bonus number one, you'll learn all about the Freedom March methodology. Bonus number two is this. It's a daily accountability and encouragement that's delivered to you via text. Uh, so er every day around noon, Central Standard Time, you'll receive a dose of inspiration, of empowerment, uh, part of it will challenge you. Most of it will just comfort you. Uh, Grace-filled messages that are crafted to encourage you and give you a boost in the middle of the day. So often, you know, you think about we crash right after lunch. That's when we get tired and groggy. And if you can just get that boost, I, I think it'll help. Uh, and then also, that, that's a real text number going out. You can respond back if you've got specific questions. And that is a number that I uh, actually monitor. Uh, bonus number three is the Soul Wholeness audiobook. That's available in the app as well. Uh, I, I read my entire 400-page book uh, in a studio, placed it on the app. Uh, we'll unlock that resource for you. That really helps you take a deeper dive. And with that workbook, I've, I've mentioned that you received this workbook as part of the, the Soul Wholeness uh, March here, the Freedom March. That daily tool, the workbook, has a journaling prompt in it every single day. So for five weeks, so, so 35 different lessons uh, in there, uh, there are uh, you know two questions following about a five-minute, read time, uh, one to two page overview. Uh, it connects with the video. So the video in the app uh, is the same content that's in that journal. So ideally you're watching it, you're kind of reading along, you're answering some questions, it all fits together. And uh, that resource uh, is, it, it's really one of my favorite, most practical resources um, that, I, that I've put together. At the end of each day, it actually tells you, hey, if you want to take an even deeper dive on today's content, go listen to this chapter in the book. 
And so you don't have to listen straight through. You could, but it will highlight and say out of out of the 25 or so chapters that are in that book, here's where to go to take a deeper dive. And sometimes it'll say, hey, you'll have access to the complete video course too. Um, so it'll say, hey, if you want to go deeper, other than these little five minute, three minute videos that you're getting every day, if you want to go deeper, here's a, here's a 15 minute video where you can take a longer look so that you can really drill down on the information that seems to resonate with your specific situation uh, the most. Uh, bonus number four is a community group and chat forum. Uh, you don't have to participate in that. You can just be a fly on the wall. I'll be participating there. But, but I found this, that many times the best lessons actually come from other people who are walking through something. And you start uh, building and engaging together and start seeing, well, hey, they got through it. I'll, I'll get through it. Or, hey, this worked for me and that. So it, it shows us that we're not flawed. Uh, we're just normal. And in fact, I would say the, the pains and hurts that you've experienced, they, they don't highlight that something's wrong with you. They actually show that something's right with you. Some of the things that you've been through, let's just be honest, it would be not normal to not be affected by those. So you'll have access to the group forum as well as my private online group where you can uh, really uh, just get wisdom and see the stories of others. And then bonus number five is you'll have access to the archives, all the past group coaching calls. Uh, that's all there. Again, if this is for you, the links are down in the show notes. You can follow that and read all the information about the course. Uh, either way, I'm happy he to be here and serve you and uh, empower you on marching towards your purpose, regardless of what that looks like. Let me sign off. I'll be back with another bonus content. And the next one, we're going to talk about guilt and shame. And I think this might be really an even bigger struggle for more people than the topic we discussed today. Here's the prayer. My prayer is that the Lord would bless you. He would keep you. He would be gracious to you. He would shine radical favor upon you that you would see and really feel and believe that the pain that you've experienced in the past, it doesn't show what's wrong with you. It actually highlights what's right. And with that, get hope and move forward towards full healing and wholeness. Grace and peace. I'll see you again soon.